sorry. We've got a couple of things. I've got to leave early because of a pending thing. I don't want to be in jail today. So I've got to get to, I've got some deadlines to meet according to the Supreme Court. I've got to get that done. But uh, we've got our primary guest today is, is Dan Gregory. He's uh, running for uh, clerk of court. Which one is it? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> He'll tell you about that when he gets up here. But uh, and most of us have heard about the registry of deeds and clerk of court on a number of occasions before. Uh, also, we've got uh, Tim Malstrom. Malstrom? Malson. Malson. Uh, he's going to talk to you briefly about that. He's done a little public service announcement already. He's got a special event he wants to talk to you about uh, dealing with, with bikes. Now, bikes are important because you know, gas prices are going up and it's becoming more important in our lives to, to, to ride economics. Um, I think. We also have a number of candidates who will have the option to speak. Cindy has a few words to say, uh, has a special event right after Dan. So if I have to leave, Eddie, Bob, take up for me. We've got, after Dan, we've got Cindy needs to speak. Anyone else after that? Dwayne, Keith? Keith is an insurance salesman, so you can see he's practicing already. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, while we're on the subject, what, what's the insurance company you work for? Uh, American General Life and Accident. American General Life and Accident. All right, and we've got Corey Norris, Troublemaker Award winner. Uh, he kind of looks like Johnny Cash. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand that, but he's in the paper again. From, uh, Irmo News. Yeah, Irmo News is in the Irmo News. They love him over there. So, they love him over there. But anyway, we've got uh, an interesting day. Uh, so, good morning, America, and uh, I'd like to introduce Dan Gregory. Dan, let's give Dan a round of applause. Thank you. 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 I tell you, I, I spent the last week uh, roaming the county, and putting up signs and everything, and jumping ditches and all that. I did a dislocation of my left foot and all that, and it is letting me know it two years ago and is letting me know it today. Um, I am Dan Gregory. I am running for the Register of Deeds, uh, not the Register of Mezzanine Conveyance, but they still like to have down in Charleston, or the state of Charleston, I should say. Real quickly, um, I grew up after my dad was in the military. Both of my parents were Marines. They went to Paris Island. Uh, they did not meet in the Marines. They both from the same town of states from North Carolina. Uh, he later went into the Air Force and, and retired. We ended up here in uh, 1976 and have lived here ever since. We attended and graduated from Irmo High School. And also, uh, yeah, I know Keith from back then, but I uh, graduated USC and I was a political science major. Whole time I was in college and, and many years after that, I worked for the state government in different positions. I was with the House and Senate Committee going through college and then ended up the Budget Control Board and the data research and census data. I also ended up precinct demographics redrawing House and Senate district, congressional districts. Met a lot of the legislators obviously that way. Um, from there I went to work in the State Senate as a legislative aide uh, to the President Pro Tem and the Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee at the time with Senator Drum who is now retired, 92 years old. Um, from that, I ended up in the uh, governor's office. From another job I did, uh, which was for free, was, was working for Sheriff Metz. I was a deputy sheriff for this county for 11 years. Did that for free. And also for two years right down here in South Congaree in the uh, late 90s. I was there. Um, from that, in the governor's office, I worked in the state office of victim assistance, having the law enforcement background uh, to work through victim claims. It's a great program. Um, from that, uh, I ended up in Richland County, working in the treasurer's office. And my main job there is, is uh, abstracting properties. In that office, we, we range from 1,300 to 1,500 properties a year that we have to abstract. Uh, this has been the biggest year. I've had to do about 300, a little over 300 deeds uh, that we had to do this year. It's more and more each year, it seems. Uh, so I do have a background in that area of, in the deeding process. My first year there, I've been there nine years doing that. My first year there, I spent at the Register of Deeds over in Richland County, 
Um, so it is an interesting time in the rest of Dean's office, believe me. Um, so basically, why am I running, of course? Uh, I'm extremely honored. It is an honor. I also want to thank uh, Mr. Steve Isom. He's, he's been there for me as a newbie to all this. I've kind of always been in the background behind politicians, but this is the first time I've run. Uh, Steve has really been there for us. Uh, these are some crazy times right now for our party, obviously. Uh, and uh, Steve has always been there. In fact, many times we've talked at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, and here lately it seems even more so. Uh, so uh, I do appreciate Steve for that. He's, he's, he's uh, been very helpful. Let me talk a little bit about and I'm, I'm, the incumbent of an office, obviously, they get to get up and talk about what they've done, obviously. They do have a record that you can look at. Uh, they do have budgets that you can look at. Um, you know, and, and basically, uh, they can just talk about good things that have happened. You as the challenger, unfortunately, because I don't really like talking bad about people, but if you just get up here and say, well, everything's wonderful in the office, I'm wasting money and my time, campaigning, everything's great, let's have a nice day, and please vote for me. Um, you know, I just think that's a disservice. But I'd like to say ahead of time, I apologize. I don't like talking bad about people, but uh, some things need to be pointed out that's going on in the office. Um, both uh, April McIver was here December 30th, 2011. I think Tommy Punt was here that day too, talking about they're both abstractors and talking about some problems in that office. Um, and then again, Debbie Gunner, the current Register of Deeds, was here January 13th uh, talking about some things in the office and, and two, back to what they were uh, mentioning that was going on in the office. Um, who can guess what the main thing people at, tell me about when I tell them I'm running for the Register of Deeds? What's that? What you do? Well, the thing is this. They say, and unfortunately they say, somebody really needs to take care of the, take care of those employees, it's, it's not a good atmosphere in the office. Unfortunately, that's the one main thing they say. I don't ask them about it; they just bring it up. Um, her actions or inactions basically to solve problems uh, and all is well for many years. But as I look through the budget, when you have problems in your office and you and you look at the budget, generally you're going to find things that when someone puts in their budget, what do we need to do better? What do I want to do in the future? And you have to write up what you're doing. Now, Debbie was up here talking about, okay, there was an old system there, and it cost so much money. That's a lot of money, what she said. And, you know, I came in, and now we're down to the county having its own system. What she failed to tell you was it took seven to nine years to make that decision. Okay? Looking at, looking at the budget from 2003 and four. When that vendor was still in place, it was close to two hundred thousand dollars a year for that system. Okay, you times that by seven and nine, that's over a million dollars. That's just due to inaction, basically. So that's one of the things I wanted to point out. Um, you know, she talks about being a, a good steward of taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, she talked about her in-house system. So. It's the thing, uh, the stewardship, let's put it this way, stewardship of county records. There was a lot of mention of that from the other opponent. And um, Tommy was talking about that too here, because they're in there every day. Uh, they said there was indexing file problems from the 60s and 70s. Um, abstractors having to write notes to other abstractors, letting them know exactly where things were. The index would tell them something else. Or they, it was not legible in the office. These are things that basically uh, that they shared with her um, and, and you know whether it, out of inaction or just not listening you know it's still there. Um, now the other thing was she talked about plats and that's what the other folks talked about too that the plats the originals are being torn up because the people had their hands on the actual originals of these plats. If you look back in the budget again, you'll see that back in the 2003 and 4, that she put in money to laminate the plats. Okay, um, so now this problem, as far as people putting their hands on original documents, again has been going on from seven to nine years. All right, now is it because 
April McIver brought this up. Then two weeks later, she shows up to this very group and says, okay, I'm going to do something about it. But we're talking seven to nine years this has been going on. So it, it, it's, it's troubling in a way. Um, so uh, the other thing is in her 2013 budget, which is just going in, she talks about that, okay, now I'm going to do something about these plats. What I, what I came up really wasn't working. That's what she said to you. Um, and review that video for January 13th of her, and you'll see her saying that. Guess what vendor she's going to have take care of Lexington County's plats? Greenville County. Why? <laughs> so Greenville County is going to take care of Lexington County's plats. Now, in all fairness to Debbie, maybe that's the cheapest way, maybe that's the easiest way, maybe that's the quickest way, because if the county doesn't have the equipment in the first place to do what's needed, and she's letting Greenville County do it at the, at the tune of about $6,000. That's in the 2013 budget. You can look at that. I have it here okay. if you want to see it. Um, so th those are some of the things that are kind of going on in the office. Uh, a lot of it's inaction, not listening to your customer. Uh, what they're what they're telling you. So what do I have for some ideas about the budget? Okay, what am I going to do? Um, you know, you always hear I'm going to save the taxpayer money. What I do, you know, I'm a good steward. I'm going to save the taxpayer's dollars. All right, I, you know, who who in this room taxes have gone down? Anybody? Here's my tax bill. It went up forty one dollars and ninety nine cents. For my home, you know, it, it's good to tell people that, but let's look at reality. Now, that means that doesn't mean to spend what you want to spend. Obviously, you still have to be a good steward, or it'll go even higher. Um, so, my ideas about the budget. Dr. Witherspoon was in here on the 13th and asked her, uh, "Has your budget gone down?" To which she replied, "Yes, it has." Well, in all actuality, it's gone over 50000 over two years from fiscal year 10 to what she's asking in 13. Your budget going up could be personnel matters. All that. That's fine if it goes up, but own it. Tell people, yes, it is going up, but this is why. Okay? Um, some ideas that I have. If I'm uh, given the privilege of being the steward there at the Register of Deeds office, you know, if I have to raise the budget by $100,000, because by doing that, I see either a piece of equipment or something that will save the county a million, you know, that just makes sense, okay? So sometimes you may have to raise it. It may be one-time money to do so, as long as you're a good steward with what you're, what you're planning, and it's to save money, obviously. Um, so, um, you know, I want to also set up a, a non-formal committee of users of the office, abstractors, lawyers, the public, and keep an ear out as to what they're seeing in the office, okay? Let's get rid of inaction to the customer that's coming into that office to use the office. That's like any business, you know, you need to listen to your customer and what they're telling you. You're not going to be around long if you don't, obviously just with any business. Um, so I want to keep my ear to the, to the end user of the office, definitely. Um, now, uh, I'm also, to, to get one copy, one, one copy in that office is 50 cents. Okay, 50 cents a piece. What does that, what does that derive for the office? It is revenue. The office derives about a million and a half a year. At this point, it is coming. It's kind of fluid right now because of what's going on in the economy. Uh, she projects forty-five thousand five hundred dollars just from the copy revenue at this time. What she charges people. Okay. Give an example. <coughs> Richland County's at twenty-five cents a page. All right. What? Well, can we can we lower that? Would that really save the taxpayer money walking in the door? Or how about the small business, the abstractor walking in? When they submit the bill to the attorney, I've got $50 in copy costs. That's part of the line. So when you go and you have a closing, that little line says what you pay 
the attorney for the closing costs and the abstract fees. Right. That's, a, that's a direct way to save money for the people. You have to study that though. How far can you go with it? About every 10 cents that you take off that 50 cents is $10,000. Okay? So I'm, I would look at that very strongly. I would study it. Now, I'm not somebody that says I'm going to study that and it makes it sound good. If it is feasible and, and physically responsible, I would love to do that and definitely change that. That's one of the ideas uh, that I'm looking at. Um, and, and basically that's a thousand six hundred sixty seven percent markup because that copy in that office costs three cents. That's oh. in her budget too. So it's correct. That's in the uh, 2013 budget, you'll see that. That's been probably an ongoing thing. Um, now, what about what about John Q. Citizen walking in? Hey, I, I need my, a copy of my deed. I misplaced, I don't know what to do. Why not give it to him for free? We're, we're talking about two or three pages? Nine cents? Can we do that? I'd love to do it. We'd study that. And if, it, if it, we can possibly do it, let's do it. You know, why not? So, I mean, that's how you can save people money and, and, and not go out there and just tell them what you're going to do. Um, another thing that kind of bothered me looking through the budget, here's our 2013 right here, is our goals. When most people have goals, they, you need quantitative goals. We produced, we, we took in this deed, we held it for a day in 0.25, scanned it. It took us two days to index it. Okay? But when I look at our goals here, it says to provide quality service to attorneys and paralegals for recording deeds and other estate documents, reasonable cost. Virtually error free indexing, to provide pro processing of original documents from the time of recording to the time that the deeds returned to the original person that put it in to the office. Um, to monitor growth and take full advantage of technology. Those are great, but how, how is that quantitative? How do we know we're doing better and we're getting we're striving and, and and we're doing better over the over time by having that generalization like that? Um, you know, so that you know as far as what's going on, uh, how about we look at how many number of days to cashier and scan? How many days it take to index? Also, what are the customers saying? What's our what's our rating? If if, if we have people fill out uh, comments and all that, or even even something we come up with to check off on, how are we doing? Are we at ninety percent favorability? God help us, seventy. How do, how do we get to the next point and we strive to do better every year if we don't have quantitative things that we're looking at for that office? How do we know we're doing, doing better or not? Um, so, I mean, that, that definitely is a thing because, you know, consequences of, of, of inaction, consequences of not looking at goals and looking at processes are very real. I see that in the treasurer's office. Guess what? If you uh, haven't got your deed filed in time and you're filing for your four percent legal residence, you're not getting it if it's not processed and given to the assessor's office. You've got a problem. You're talking a couple thousand dollars in taxes additional until that gets done. And sometimes, if it takes long enough, you'll have to go ahead and pay that tax bill and, and wait on a refund. So. I, you know, I, I had more to say, but, you know, I don't want to take up all your time. Uh, I'm here. If you, if you need to ask me any questions, I do apologize again. I'm not, it's not really my makeup to talk bad about people or what's going on, but, you know, sometimes you have to kind of bring some things up. Uh, and, and I will say Debbie's done some great things, you know. I just, I just think in some ways she's lost her way or she's not keeping an ear uh, to what people are, are needing. In that office right now. But I thank you very much. Well, well, Diane, thank and, you. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
Steve, you had a question? Um, yeah. Just, you were talking about, um, I guess, a citizen type of committee, which I think is a good right. idea. Uh, and maybe you already have this because I haven't been on the website in a while. But um, a suggestion area or on, on your website might, you know, or being able to file the deeds online. Yeah, that's to, something that's coming to fruition is the electronic file. Okay. The other thing that I was thinking is, it seems to me that in most governments, a lot of the cost of that, well, I see as wasteful cost, is our, our administrative cost. So I'm, I'm wondering, have, have you considered the idea of Okay, let's say using a law student or a paralegal student to help with the register as interns. You cut down on costs, you teach them about the, uh, about the law, uh, which is something they're studying. Um, get a political science student from USC or Bennett or, 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 or one of the other local colleges to, and, and if they're interns, so it's basically a free thing, and they get the excuse. It. They, they get the experience, it looks great on their resume, and you also can, it's also a way of recruiting inside, from the inside, if they're doing a good job. So they can do a lot of the, um, the I guess the grunt, grudge work that's taking up a lot of the separate Well, you're, you're preaching to the choir, because you're seeing a product of internships with government. It's right here. Okay. So, I mean, so I, I mean, I, I would have no problem because, uh, you know, our youth, obviously, and people coming up are our future. You always hear that, but it's very true. Uh, I got my start by being an intern with the State and House Committee. It's very true as a political science major, and, and I fully support that. I will listen to anything. I will listen to anything. But I'm going to be truthful to tell you, yes, this will work. No, that won't. Why not? You know, all this. I just won't give you but an could, answer. But could that could that work? I mean, I mean, anything in an intern, I think that any, even small businesses or, or even in government, you've got to give the youth a chance to, to get their foot in the door and train them and let them see what it is in the real world. I mean, it, it, it's so hard. Uh, the, the, they, they've proven it. The college students who did not do an internship are the ones that are sitting at home with their parents, not able to get a job because they have no experience, okay, because they didn't take that next step and seek out the internships. That's the crux of what helped me as a poli sci major at USC, was getting into the government and through an internship program. So definitely, definitely, I, I mean, any ideas, that's the thing. That's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm talking about is, I want to be an ear out to what's going on in that office, what needs to be better, and it should be not just when you're running for re-election and stuff like that, it needs to be constant. Constantly. Always. All right, one more question. Anyone else have a question? Okay, Ben, thanks for being here. I think today. I wore them out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. It is an honor, very much so. Well, next we have a uh, really a public service announcement. There's a special event May 16th. Tim Malson. Tim, come on up and tell us tell everyone about your event. I'd like to say thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about the Ride of Silence. Uh, the Ride of Silence was started in Dallas, Texas after a, a cyclist was killed 10 years ago. Uh, his friends got together in a, in a silent funeral procession type ride. Uh, news of that ride quickly spread. The following year, there were over 100 rides across America. Uh, I've been involved with the Ride of Silence now for five years. Uh, we've had the ride in Richland County for the previous four. Uh, I just opened a new bike shop here in Lexington County on Meeting Street, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to have the ride on this side of the river. Uh, the idea of the ride is, is, is quite simple. Uh, we ride no faster than 12 miles an hour. We ride no more than two abreast, uh, and nobody talks. And to, to be on a ride where no cyclist actually talks is, is, is an amazing thing to me. <laughs> um, the ride is May 16th. It starts at 7 p.m. It starts at 7 p.m. around the globe. Uh, so 7 o'clock Eastern, everybody will ride. 7 o'clock Central, the Midwest will ride, and so on and so on. 
as, as uh, the day wears on. Um, we will have a police escort, uh, West, West Columbia PD uh, will be there to, to block the intersections and, and keep us safe. Uh, all riders are invited to attend, uh, no matter your ability. Uh, when I say no faster than 12 miles an hour, the average speed will probably be closer to 10 miles an hour. Uh, I hope it, that you can attend, spread the word, it's a great event. There will be a lot more cyclists on the roads, as Steve mentioned. Uh, gas prices are only getting higher. and. Uh, I won't even talk about the health benefits of cycling, but it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, so again, I hope you can all attend. Do you have any questions? What was the date again? Uh, May 16th, Wednesday, 7 p.m. start. So the, the, uh, and the ride will leave from our shop on Meeting Street. It'll proceed west on US 1 up to Leapheart Road, over to Hook Avenue, and then come back down on 378 uh, back to State, and then back on US 1. Jim, what, what type of cycles do you sell and who's your main customer? Uh, well, we sell all types of bicycles, uh, from bikes for, for the tots, uh, two, three-year-old kids, all the way up to you know professional level. You know, I've got an $8,000 bike sitting in my store. Ooh. I've also got $300 bikes sitting in my store. So uh, we're, we're, a, we're a notch above what you might find at the department stores, uh, which I have a hard time classifying as a bicycle. Don't call me a snob, please. <laughs> <laughs> I fix those bikes, and I know what, what kind of quality uh, the Walmarts of the world put out. So, uh, but yeah, we, we 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 do it all. Uh, I've got, you know, I can tell you some great stories about folks who have come in and been just floored and, and sticker shocked by by a four hundred dollar bike, and two years later they're riding a two thousand dollar wonder machine, uh, and, and racing and, and competing in, in hundred mile charity events and, and stuff like that. So. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. I mean. Uh, and the ride of silence may be out for most of the people because most of these people have a hard time remaining silent like me. <laughs> you know, but but what's the what's the most economical, I would say cheap, but I'll say economical bike you have? Um, I sell a, a, a line called the uh, Felt Cafe series that is a, uh, you know, it, that name sounds expensive to me. <laughs> it's about $500. I mean, about $500. $500. Okay. Uh, but you know, if you amortize that over, over the 10 years that that bike will last you, if not longer, then you know, fifty bucks a year is pretty cheap for a so bike. So that's the economical end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But that, but that, that's about uh, what one tank of gas a year. A year. Sure. Okay. A year. You that's know what I'm saying? Fifty dollars a year to to ride a bike. Um, and and I do uh, appreciate the, the bike lanes that I'm seeing around Casey. I don't know who's been involved with that, but it's it's great to see more and more bike lanes uh, out there. How's, how how are your moped sales coming along? Well, I don't do anything motorized. <laughs> I'm all about human power here. <laughs> I see a lot of those mopeds out there nowadays. I'm and and you're going to see a lot more of those as well. Uh, obviously, that's a more economical way to travel. Uh, and so I mean, there's, there's a lot of people selling them, that's for sure. Now, the person to your left, Howard Shepard, is associated with South Carolina Railroad Museum. Uh -huh. Howard, do you have any, any uh, bicycles up there? <laughs> the museum. Antique, antique uh, bicycles related to the railroad? <laughs> No, we don't. That's a good thought, though, because they, they did have some uh, uh, that fit on one rail, and then the, and the other uh, uh, one fit over on the other rail yeah. uh, across. Mm. You could ride it and stuff. Mm. We don't have anyone like that, but that's a, we, when you bring it up, that's a good thought. Then. So, Tim, are you saying you'd like to see bicycles parked outside the restaurant the instead of automobiles? And Absolutely. Oh, wow. In a utopian, in my utopian society. <laughs> It would be nothing but bicycles. Uh, so, so what's the insurance cost? For like, a, is the insurance cost for having a bike like a car now? I mean, what's, what's happening with that? Uh, other than health insurance, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you never can tell how these laws will come down. You know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Corey's shaking his head. Corey, you have any thoughts on insurance and bicycles? <laughs> well, I got plenty of thoughts on a lot. Of that. <laughs> I just wanted to know who's going to pedal it up that hill by my house. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hills are easy. Hills are easy. Um, That's right. Gear. First year. Uh, <laughs> drop, her, drop her down and, and crank it up. That hill up my house. <laughs> I can't walk up that hill. How about that? You do, yeah. so you do repair bike. I mean, because I like, I have, I have what, I three on it. I lived four years in Holland, and if you've ever lived in Holland, you stop at a red light, you'll have 5,000 bicycles yes, yeah. within 15 seconds. Wow. And also over there, they recognize the bicycle lane. If you 
take your car and cross a bicycle lane without stopping and making sure a bicycle is not coming, you're in trouble. In, in, in most of Europe, the pedestrian comes first, the cyclist comes second, and the car comes last. Right. And as it should be. Because the pedestrian is the most vulnerable, the cyclist is the second most vulnerable, and the car is the least vulnerable. Keith, Keith, you had a question. Yeah, and that's actually, yeah, according to the South Carolina uh, uh, EMV, yeah, so get involved, that's actually well, how it's supposed to be in South Carolina, but not always. But do you say, see so you repair bikes? Yes. I have, uh, actually, I need to get the, I've got the kind with three on, the three, three gears on this side, and seven gears on mm -hmm. this side. Three on this side need to be. Okay. Yep. I, I fix everything. Yeah, 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 fix. Everything that's fixable. Can you tell me gears you're talking about? Yeah, fix, fix. Okay. That's 21 right that there. That sounds like, how expensive are we talking about here, man? The more gears, the more for me. You're talking about a $2,000 bicycle? No, I think I bought a one for under 200 from Walmart. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, y
at the State House today, um, which explains the reading of the role of the dead. And then we also create cockades, um, which have been used since the early wars. People wore them, the colors, they wore them on their hats, the men wore them on their hats. And it was support of political things that were going on, support of the war, support of whatever was going on. So if you'd like to have one of these, let me know. You're welcome to. And then I'll show you our cockades that we've made. Um, the, all the chapters have made them are this um, for this particular event, they're purple and black, um, for memorial services. Um, we're asking for donations because we're not allowed to sell them on the State House grounds, so we're asking for a $2 donation. Um, what the monies are going to is the ladies of the OCR have created a um, marker, as the Sons of Confederate Veterans have one, the Order of Confederate Rose now has one for women um, that have supported um, soldiers. And um, so we're going to start um, marking some of the, the ladies' graves as well as the, the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and so we're going to use our monies for that purpose. So feel free to come out and see us um, and stop by. If you have a minute to read, I would appreciate that and then support of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dean. Any other uh, announcements or anyone else like to have anything to say about the event coming up that the public would be interested in? I know we have a lot of other politicians here, and uh, just let me know if you want to say anything. I know most of you have spoken before, but uh, otherwise... I don't, I don't know, Steve, are we still politicians? <laughs> <laughs> we want to be now, politicians. Now let, let, me, let me say... <clears throat> Because of the Supreme Court ruling, <laughs> I'm having to follow a certain direction. At any rate, the, uh, the Corey's question is, is, is he's asking a very valid question, but um, states, I hope we have statesmen. Statesmen is a good word to use. Do we have statesmen? I'm hoping that's what we're developing here in South Carolina. And but we have a lot of good people running for office, let me say that. Um, and remember, this is a nonpartisan group, uh, and we've had Occupy Columbia and all sorts of groups here. This, and everyone that stands here is responsible for their own comments. Uh, there's no implied endorsement or anything. But, you know, this is an open forum for people to have discussions. Now, some of you are wondering why Mr. Gettings didn't have his harmonica this morning. And, and Mr. Gettings didn't tell us why. I don't want to tell us why you've been so quiet. Corey's planning for it. I figured that, that everybody would appreciate it. <laughs> Understanding, he's been other places with us all, um, and he's supposed to get leave any donations from the millions he may make from that song to this group, so okay. we could have actually a free breakfast plan yeah. every Friday. Mr. Gaines, I beg your pardon. Uh, Alzheimer's, <laughs> Alzheimer's is setting in with some of us now. Uh, okay, Mr. Gaines, you don't you don't want to say that post. That's okay. All right, I'll try to get him to let me sing that song at the uh, state Republican <laughs> convention. We'll see. Talbot Black, the most influential uh, patriot leader in the state. Talbot Black, the most influential You know, I always say that. Okay, that's it. Steve, I, I would like to put in a good word for the Supreme Court this morning. Boo, yeah. Right, David, go ahead. Watch it. American I, David wants to say something. All right, go ahead, go ahead, dude. Well, I, I think a lot of people are attacking the court because they did their job. They they interpret it, or they, they are enforcing a poorly written, poorly executed law. It's not the court's fault that, that they were presented with that case, and they, and they ruled exactly the right way. It's up to the legislature now to fix that law and make it right. And really, honestly, I don't, I don't think it's going to survive the Justice Department, the U.S. Justice Department anyway, because the U.S. Justice Department is not going to let us throw all the non-incumbents off the ballot. Um, but hopefully it will be solved the correct way by the legislature, and the legislature should be meeting right now, they should be, of course they're not, to fix the law, and, and they, could, they could make this right by tomorrow, they could have something on the governor's desk tomorrow night to, to resolve this problem. Yeah, but the, the problem say, is, the legislature has no vested interest. We're going to give them turn this around because 
We'll give them a vest. The bill affects their challengers. That's right, right. exactly. Yeah. As of right now, they will no longer have a challenger, so that makes life easy for them. You know, and I agree exactly what you said, David. The problem with their strict interpretation of the law this time, which I agree with, they need to strictly interpret the law exactly the way it's written. That's what we've been saying for years and years. But it's a selective enforcement because there's precedent where they, or, or there's a prior ruling um, from, I forget what how many years ago it was, not very long ago, where they ruled that where there was no fraudulent intent, then it was no, no problem. They allowed this, uh, they, they interpret the spirit of the law, not the right. Letter. So it's a very selective enforcement, and which calls into question the independence of the judiciary. They're not you know, independent. They they are unilaterally appointed by the general assembly. Now I'm not saying it was a political ruling, but it sure calls into question. Nobody can be sure. There's no public confidence that it wasn't a political ruling. It was a it was a it, it, it's a legislative coup d'état. But what what David said is exactly right. The way to fix this is not an appeal to the Justice Department. It's not an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. It is a demand that our General Assembly goes into session immediately and fixes this through South Carolina's General Assembly. They can fix it immediately. That's right. It's fixable through our General Assembly. They fix the law. They enact it. It's retroactive for this election. And if they don't, they deserve forward, charge others. We need to make sure they have motivation to do that. Thank you, David. Comments. Let me. Uh, well, the Finn Tower agreement must be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and there's more comments, mate. But let me let me say, I can't I, I can't comment on some of this now. I'm just I'm just having to follow directly to the Supreme Court. But again, everyone here has their opinion. Yeah, yeah. This is a great uh, forum for that. So, Mr. Benton, you had a comment? Okay. Uh, I watched the documentary uh, on the loss of on TV the other day. Where they were using prisoners to do farm work. They had uh, a garden in the prison or on prison grounds that grew food for the prison. And I don't see why South Carolina can't do that. They had murderers out there with hoes tending the garden. Okay? And they had guards on horseback with rifles ready to shoot them if they tried to run away. Okay, now everybody's saying get the Mexicans out of the United States. Okay, if we get all the Mexicans out of the United States, we will be paying possibly $5 for a, for a dollar. Okay, so my idea would be have the farmer or have the orchard uh, put, a, put a, an advertisement in the paper statewide that he needs 300 pickers, okay? If he doesn't get enough pickers in that, have it put in a newspaper up in the two adjacent states. If he doesn't get enough pickers there, go to DJJ and go to minimum security prisons, offer the same wages that you would give a Mexican to the prisoners. 25% of it would go to the state, the rest would go to the prisoner, for he could have a can, uh, canteen fund. His parents wouldn't have to send money to him or anything like that. This way, the prisoners would be getting out of the prison a little while, and you could make some money too. So, and we could possibly get rid of all the Mexicans. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think you mean to say those that are here illegally. Right. Yeah. <laughs> don't, just, don't, don't put everybody from Mexico. Okay. All, all illegal. All and, illegal. And not just illegal Mexicans, but anybody who's here. Or Central and South America. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I think that's a good, I think that's a good idea, idea except for everyone, everyone's responsible for their own comments. <laughs> I just want to say, look, look, that's, that's, uh, they our formal discussion today and thanks for coming and, and Dan thank you. Let's give Dan thank a round of applause. Until next Friday.